Proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail our women in service. Our story is entitled, A Ring of Stars. This is the story of a woman who saw the beginning of our nation and dreamed of what it might become. The story is a legend. Some say it never happened, and maybe it never did. But it could have happened, and the legend has taken such a firm root in the cradle of our country that the woman of the legend will always live in our minds and hearts. This is the story of the woman she was and of what might have happened to Betsy Ross. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... A word to the young women of America. Have you heard about the excellent opportunities for advancement in the expanding Women's Army Corps? Enterprising young women who can qualify are urged to enlist now. You know, every day more young women are finding out the full details about job openings in the Women's Army Corps. So why not visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station? Have a talk with the recruiting sergeant. He'll be glad to give you all the information. Volunteer for the WAC today. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, A Ring of Stars. I saw a ring in the sky. A shining white ring like the circle of eternity, shining with the purity of love and honor. All around it were flames of red and blue. And I did not know what this great ring was. But as I looked, it became larger, till I thought it must encircle the whole world. It was a shining circle like a ring of stars. And it looked as if it would remain unbroken forever. I was a part of that shining circle, unwillingly, as a Quaker and a pacifist. But like all who lived in the 13 colonies in 1776, I was caught up in the circle and forced to reflect its glory. My name is Abel James, of James and Drinker, Shippers, Philadelphia. But this is not my story. It's the story of my little niece, Betsy, my favorite she was, as I knew her and the world knew her, before our country and our flag were born. You know her as Betsy Ross. She was born Betsy Griscom to my sister Rebecca and her husband Samuel at their Quaker home in Philadelphia in 1752. I was often away from home, sometimes with my ships, sometimes traveling to Virginia and the Carolinas to buy tobacco for the old world so that I could bring in cargoes of tea and sugar, spices, silks and woolens to the new. But between trips, I was a frequent visitor to my sister's home. One Saturday in April, 1762, I came up the stone walk of my sister's house. Betsy and her little sister Rachel, with some of the other children from their school in Drinker's Alley, were standing in a circle playing Hunt the Squirrel. You know this game from your own childhood as Drop the Handkerchief. They run around the circle now, away from each other, till they meet again. And little Johnny bows to Betsy. Now he's it and must tap somebody else. Uncle Abel, <laughs> when did you get back from England? Just now, my dear child. My ship has just landed. Uh, are your mother and father home? Oh, yes, Uncle. Oh, they'll be so glad to see you. We just finished spring cleaning. The house will welcome you, too. Oh, don't be long, Betsy. The circle isn't big enough without you. Mother, father, Uncle Abel's here. Abel, my 
My dear brother. Rebecca. Oh, Welcome so home, Abel. Hello, Samuel. You look well, friend. Yes, he does. A successful trip, I hope? Yes, indeed. I sold my cargo and brought back many fine materials. Oh. Silks, brocades, and woolen. Oh, <laughs> well, did you bring any quiet greys that would befit a lady in the Friends Society? Oh, yes, of course. Especially for you, Rebecca. Will you excuse us, Uncle Abel? Sally Drinker and the others are waiting for us to finish the game. Yes, of course, my dears. Go ahead. Come, Rachel. Let's show our gifts to Sally. Uh, Abel, I'll make some tea for us. Uh, you come into the back garden and see how Samuel's flowers are growing. Thank you, Rebecca. Tea will be fine. Oh, you're always so thoughtful, Abel. No wonder the children love you. Don't be long, my dear. Uh, come into the garden, Abel. We'll have a pipe while we wait for Rebecca. Very well, Samuel. Oh, you must have many stories to tell of your voyage, huh? Every night for the past six months... Betsy has said the prayer for those at sea, for you. Bless the child. You know, Samuel, not just because she's my sister's child, but Betsy's going to grow up to be a wonderful woman. You mark my words. That was one of many such family reunions during the time young Betsy Ross was growing up. Each time I came home and saw her again, she was a little gayer and a little prettier. Her sparkling blue eyes seemed even brighter because of her sober Quaker dress. That little Rachel was a pretty child too, but she was content to stay in the background and share the general admiration for Betsy rather than be admired herself. Ten years had passed since I brought her the blue silk, and Betsy was now a young lady. She had finished school, and being a fine seamstress, she had taken work at Friend William's upholstery shop, where young John Ross was an apprentice. Then, on one of my returns, I noticed a shadow in Betsy's eyes, and I knew that something was wrong. Welcome home, Uncle Abel. Mother and Rachel are at the market, and Father's gone to a meeting at Carpenter's Hall. Well, it's good to see you, Betsy. How are you, my child? It's good to see you, too, Uncle. Come into the garden. Very well. You look sad, child. Not like yourself at all. Is something troubling you? Well, to tell the truth, I, I've never been so happy and... And yet I'm greatly troubled. Then it must be love that's troubling you. Uncle, how did you know? <laughs> and I make no claims to wisdom, Betsy, nor yet to magic arts of fortune-telling. But when a young lady tells me she's happy, which I can see in her blue eyes, and at the same time greatly troubled, which I can also see, I do not have to look for more signs to know that she is in love. <sighs> but why does love trouble you, my dear? Young Claypool loves you devotedly and always has. Oh, but I don't love him. If I did, there would be no trouble. He's of the Society of Friends. Who, then? But not John Ross. Yes, Uncle. What can I do? It's not enough that he's a church member instead of a friend, but to be the son of the Episcopal minister. Are you sure you love him, child? Sometimes the first bloom of love is a false one that dies with early frost. No, Uncle, I am quite sure. What am I to do? It will distress mother and father sorely if I'm wedded outside the society. You know what the Book of Discipline says. Yes. Mixing in marriage with those not of our profession is an unequal yoking which brings ill consequence to the parties. It is a hard say. Yes, Uncle, but I know John. He's a good man. and There's no better Christian than his father in spite of his being the rector of Christ Church. Take the word of a lonely old man, child. Follow your heart. Your parents will be hurt, it's true, but sometimes pain brings understanding. And then who knows, perhaps they'll be better friends themselves if they're forced to accept a love that goes outside the profession. Huh? Dear Uncle Abel, you've taken a load off my heart. I, I believe that you can understand so well. Mother and father must understand, too, in time. I'll speak to them tonight. Bless you, my child. And may all go well with you and John. Uh, 
And eventually, Betsy became her bright self again. But still, she had to go through tears and shadows. Her parents were grieved, and Betsy, loving them, grieved too. She knew that the elder would be obliged to expel her from the society, and that this would hurt them most of all. But she was wise enough to know that once the step was made, and once she was John's wife, things would not seem so dark to them. So she and John made their plans, with my blessing. At times, I felt like a wicked old fool to encourage them. But later, I thanked God that I had. Finally, all was ready. John had saved enough money to buy his own house and shop on Arch Street, and he and Betsy eloped to New Jersey to be married. I saw them off that day in 1772 when they boarded the horse ferry to Gloucester. God bless you, Betsy, and you too, John. Well, you look like a real dandy in that wedding suit. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Won't you reconsider and come with us? Oh, yes, Uncle, please do. No, no, Betsy, I must go and see your mother. The sooner I tell her where you've gone and why, the longer she will have to face and understand it by the time you return. Well, that's true, Betsy. We must make it as easy for your mother as we can. Oh, you've been so kind to us, sir. We'll never forget your help. Yeah, I don't suppose my sister will either. But it's Betsy's own life, and I feel very confident she's doing the right thing. Oh, uh, just one question, John. Yes? How about your marriage bond? It's very dear in New Jersey, isn't it? It's 500 pounds sterling. I've saved most of it, and William Hugg, who will attend us, is lending us the rest. Thank you for asking, Uncle. We'll be all right. I'm sure you will, with God's help. Take care of it, John. Goodbye. Oh, give me a kiss, dear Uncle. Mm. Bless you, dear. Uh, we'll be home tonight and see you often. Yes, Goodbye, oh. sir. Goodbye. 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 I stood there as the boat pulled away from the shore, praying for their happiness, which I believed was in God's hands. And I have never seen a young couple anywhere who looked more as if they belonged together, and always would, looking at that happy boy and girl. I never dreamed how short their happiness would be. You are listening to the proudly we hail production, A Ring of Stars. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. Here's a word to the young women high school graduates of 52. Love and loyalty to one's country have never been the exclusive attributes of men. Women, too, have shown evidence of their devotion and courage. Now, more than ever before, the United States Army and the United States Air Force need young women. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Have a talk with a recruiting sergeant. Find out how you can best serve your country and yourself. Volunteer for service in the WAC. Women's Army Corps, or WAF, Women in the Air Force, today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail. And now we present the second act of A Ring of Stars. And so Betsy Griscom became Betsy Ross. She and John went to live in his house and upholstering shop on Arch Street, and it looked for some time as if, after all, they would have a long and happy married life together. But there were rumblings in the colonies, and the rumblings were growing louder. The Stamp Act had been followed by the Townsend Act, which brought the rumblings to my very door. One morning in 1773, as I walked to my warehouse, I found my partner, Henry Drinker, standing at the door in front of a gathering crowd. Well, good morning, Will. Sam, how are you? But, but none of you speaks. Henry, what's the matter? Take a look at this poster, Abel. The firm of James and Drinker is asked not to accept the shipment of tea due to dock in the harbor this day from the East India Company. As long as the Townsend tax obtains, any imports of tea will be looked upon as an act against the free British people of these colonies. Signed, the Tar and Feathering Committee. Well, well, Henry, I thought this was coming. 
What do you think we'd better do? You'd better send it back. No tea drinking at three fence tags abound. Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, this may cause violence. We are friends, men of peace. Are you friends of the colonies or friends of Parliament? Now then, just a minute. Just a minute, friends. Henry and I want to do the right thing, but we have to talk this over. And what are you talking? The ship is docking in the harbor. But this may ruin us. If you take this ship, but you will be ruined. Nobody will buy from you again. I want my money. Abel, will. perhaps we'd better send it back. Ships are going back from New York every day, the committee says. The shippers there know what side they're on. In Charleston, they've taken all the tea and locked it up in a vault. I think you're right, Henry. We'll go to the dock and tell the captain. This will be a voyage he'll never forget. I have a feeling we will never forget it either. The war was still far off. But the revolution had begun. And we were still divided, Tory and Whig, Quaker and violent radical. But the day would come when the tea kettle would boil over and make patriots of us all. On Christmas Day, 1773, we were gathered at Betsy's home for a family dinner. Samuel, Rebecca and Rachel, Betsy, John and I. And on that day of joy and peace, we were all happy because the family was reunited. But the news was far from peaceful. Abel, what do you think of the news? From what the Committee of Correspondence says, your ships aren't the only ones returning to England with their full load of tea. Yes, if the tax isn't lifted, it's likely that we'll all forget the taste of tea entirely. Mm. I've almost forgotten it already. But here, a glass of port for Christmas time. Uh, Thank you. Your health, gentlemen. Your and health. You. Uncle Abel. Here's friend Henry to see you. Well, come in, Mr. Dinker. Uh, won't you join us in a glass of port? Hey, Henry, what brings you out on Christmas Day? Hello, Samuel. Uh, Abel, I have news from the Committee of Correspondence. I thought you ought to hear it. I can see in your face that it's no light matter. Sam Adams has had a party in Boston Harbor. With a band of men disguised as Indians, he raided the East India ships. He burst open 343 chests of tea and threw them in the water. The devil what? Yes. Oh, well, well, can you... The sons of liberty will lead us to violence yet. Do you not think they're right, sir? It's hard to say they're wrong. But I wonder where it will all end. The end was nowhere in sight. The long struggle was just beginning. But things happened fast after Sam Adams' tea party. Have you heard, General Washington, about the attacks on Lexington and Concord? Yes. It looks as if the lines are fully drawn. We cannot draw back from standing for our rights now, no matter what the outcome. Hey, 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 hey. The Continental Congress in Philadelphia assembled has proclaimed the organization of the American Continental Army. The Congress has appointed as commander General George Washington of the Colony of Virginia. John Ross was one of the first volunteers. As a militiaman, he was assigned the task of guarding the stores of guns and ammunition brought in by James and Brinker and other shippers from the West Indies to speed the cause of liberty. One cold day in January 1776, I was worried about some supplies that had just come in, and I walked down from my warehouse to the wharf. I got there just in time, or rather, just too late. Oh! What is it? What happened? The ammunition has exploded! John! John! Oh. He's wounded. Get help here. Right. Yes. We'll have to take him home. Here, Will! Easy Stand there. guard in his place. Sam, help, help me carry him. Yeah. Oh. John? Oh, John! Easy now, Betsy, easy. He was hurt. Oh! We must get him into the house. Come on, Sam. Oh, John. I, I'm all right, Betsy. I'm all right.
But John was not all right. He died within the hour. Betsy mourned him with her whole heart. She lived alone in the little house that she and John had shared for four short, turbulent years, and she continued to take work for the sewing and upholstering shop. For Betsy's fame as a fine seamstress had spread throughout the colony, and her naturally bright spirit sustained her in spite of the lonely hours. Though she was no longer a member of the Friend Society, she had never stopped being a true Quaker. For she said one day to me, My spirit shall be devoted to God and to my country. And whenever the spirit moves me, I'll sing and shout for liberty. And finally, in June 1776, the day came for which Betsy Ross was born and for which she will long be remembered. Yes, gentlemen. Oh, Uncle Abel, how are you? Uh, Betsy, my dear, this is General Washington. Oh, I I'm honored, sir. Won't you come in? Thank you, Mistress Ross. Uh, won't you sit down? What can I do for you? Uh, thank you, Betsy. The General hasn't much time, so we'll get right down to business. As Mr. James has said that you can help me, Mistress Betsy. Well, yes, General, I'll be happy if I can. I in what way, sir, can I be of help? The Army has no flag. Mistress Betsy, we need a banner, a symbol which will lead us on to victory. No flag? Well, I, I thought I had seen many flags among the troops. Well, that's true, Betsy, too many. But we have no one flag to represent all 13 colonies. The closest thing we have to a unifying symbol is the Union Jack with 13 stripes. And I feel we must not adopt the flag of the British King when we are fighting for independence from the crown. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I hadn't thought of that. I uh, have a design here, Mistress Betsy. A ring of 13 stars on a blue field with 13 stripes, red and white, alternating. Do you think you could make us a flag on this design? Why, yes, General, I think I could. You hesitate. Not because of difficulty, I think. Oh, no. I was thinking, General, do you not think the flag would stand out more clearly if the stripes at top and bottom were red instead of white? Why, yes, yes, of course that's so. Upon my word, Mr. James, you brought me to the right person. Indeed I did. I didn't know myself what a good choice I'd made. But uh, you were still hesitating, Mistress Betsy. If you have another suggestion, let us hear it. Oh, I, I know you didn't ask me to redesign it for you, General, but... Do the stars have to have six points? I think they'd be much prettier with five. They would be prettier. Yeah, I thought of that. But I thought it'd be very difficult to cut them out with five points, preserving the symmetry required. Oh, oh, oh no, General. Uh, let me show you. Uh, let's see. I'll uh, fold this piece of paper. Uh, there. With one snip of the scissors, you see? But a perfect star. Bless me, Yes. Go ahead, by all means, and make the stars with five points. You look quite happy now. Uh, no other suggestions, I take it? None. When would you like the flag? May we have it within the week? I'll do it by tomorrow. Thank you, Mistress Betsy. I wish I might have you on my staff. Betsy Ross was as good as her word. She worked the rest of that day and long into the night, shaping stripes and stars of bunting in red and white, squaring the edges of a deep blue field, and sewing them together with binding of sailcloth and strong cord so that the first American flag could wave securely through the long, bitter years that lay ahead. And then the next day. Oh, Good morning, General Washington. Come in, won't you? And you, Uncle Abel? I uh, hope we haven't come too early. Oh, no. I have it ready for you, General. Come into the parlor. Uh, over here. Uh, well, here it is. Mistress Betsy. Mistress Betsy, I don't quite know what to say. Don't you like it, General? Well, if there's something wrong... Like it? Oh, no, no, there's nothing wrong. This flag is a symbol of courage, honor, purity, and loyalty. 
And you have made it a thing of beauty. Yes, indeed you have, Betsy. I am greatly indebted to you, madam. And so is the cause of American liberty. I pledge to you that I will do my best to lead this flag to victory. And that whatever its fate, I will honor it to the end of my days. Y you do me a great honor, General. I am glad you're pleased with it. Now you want to take it with you. Just a minute, I'll, I'll roll it and, and wrap a piece of muslin around it. Thank you, Mistress Betsy. I believe we may have made history on this day. Now, will you come with me, Mr. James? And if you don't need me, General, I think I'll stay a while and visit, if I'm not intruding, Betsy. Oh, of course not, Uncle Abel. I'm delighted. Goodbye, General Washington. I if I can help again, I, I hope you'll call on me. Rest assured, I will. Oh, will you come into the kitchen with me, Uncle Abel? I'll make up a cup of chocolate. Uh, thank you, Betsy. That would be very nice. Now, uh, you sit over there, Uncle Abel, and talk to me. I'm... I'm proud of you, Betsy. And I know John would be, too. Oh, thank you for saying that, Uncle Abel. You know, I had a dream last night about John and about the flag. I fell asleep while I was sewing on the stars, and, and I dreamed I saw them shining in the sky, a dark blue sky with a shining ring of stars like the circle of eternity. And suddenly, the sky became a blue field in heaven, and I heard John's voice saying, I'm proud of you, Betsy. You've served our country well. I knew then, Uncle Abel, that John's death was not in vain, that somehow he had become part of a shining circle that would endure. I heard his voice no more, but then I saw the flag with the ring of stars and the flowing stripes of red and white growing so big that it seemed to spread out over this whole great land. And then I, I saw it marching to countries I'd never seen. All the lands where your ships have sailed, the strange countries you used to tell me about when I was a little girl. And though it was a dream, I knew with certainty that these stripes and these bright stars would shine forever to light the way to justice and freedom for mankind. <laughs> Young woman, how about your future? Does it include an interesting and important job? A job that will take you to the exciting places of the world, places where tomorrow's history is being made today. Right now, young women like yourself are urgently needed to serve their country in the Women's Army Corps. Here's your opportunity to secure your future. Go to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station and get all the facts today. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station by the United States Army and the United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail.